Major John Kiefer Mahoney, a former Vancouver newspaper man, receives the Empire's highest award for gallantry, the Victoria Cross. On Empire Day, Major Mahoney took his company across the River Melpa to establish a vital bridgehead. Although he had been wounded three times, he and his men held on in full view of the enemy. Single-handed, he cleaned out a troublesome machine gun nest. Under fierce and palating fire, his inspired leadership aided an important phase of the attack. Only when full reinforcements arrived would he allow his wounds to be dressed. At a mess dinner, his comrades of the New Westminsters paid tribute to that gallant warrior, Mahoney, V.C. During their first furlough in Italy, the quacks visit the ruins of ancient Pompeii. In the days when the javelin and the ballista did the work of Bren Gun and 5.5, Pompeii was a flourishing provincial town. It boasted a population of 20,000 Romans, about the size of Brandon, Manitoba, or Guelph, Ontario. In the year AD 79, old Pappy Vesuvius turned on the heat and made the city a replica of the Wilhelmstrasse after a thousand plane raid. The ghosts of ancient days are conjured up under the spell of the guide stories. Studying history the easy way provides a pleasant outing away from park to orders and the daily grind. The quacks will have interesting tales for the bridge club, Afri La Guerre beneath. In Piedimonte, the boys of a famous western regiment have cooked up a donkey derby. A wee donkey is christened Gremlin Mark II and is adopted by visiting quacks of the army show. Bookmaking is strict layout. Betting is through the wicket. It's a fair field and a fast track. All the blue bloods of Muledom are out to carry home the silks of their company. Run on the lines of a steeplechase, anything is apt to happen. Instead of a water jump, it's a battle course. Some of the entries display national characteristics. But then our donkeys haven't read the manual of military law. It's a photo finish by the Army Film Unit. The odds-on favorite is a handy winner. Named after the wife of the O.C., Lady Bell Irving, piloted by jockey Private Olson, takes the cut. In Normandy, General Montgomery decorates Canadian paratroops and airborne troops. Men who drop deep into enemy territory on D-Day listen to words of praise from their chief. A difficult job, well and nobly done, brings citations to Captain Griffin of Toronto, who is awarded the Military Cross. To Captain Hanson of Westmount, Quebec, the Military Cross. To Captain Kiefer, commander of French troops of number three commando, the Military Cross. Sergeant Harvey Morgan of Montreal receives the Military Medal. To Lance Corporal Russell Geddes of Sudbury, Ontario, goes the Military Medal. And to Corporal Noville of Toronto, the Military Medal. A full complement of nursing sisters of a Canadian General Hospital are briefed before leaving for France. On every front where Canadian troops are engaging the enemy, the Canadian medical services will be found unobtrusively doing a tremendous job. Held in the highest esteem by fighting men, the RCAMC represents to them not only the professional alleviator of pain, but the kindly individual friend. The success of this relationship is largely due to the nursing sisters. Trained for life in the field, they must be able to carry on in slit trenches under the worst battle conditions. Leaving behind the comparative comforts of England, 
The Florence Nightingales of 1944 embark for the battlefronts of Normandy. There they will carry on their job of bringing to the Canadian soldier that kindly professional care that means so much. Personnel is made up mostly from Hamilton, Kitchener and Guelph, Ontario. It is the first Canadian general hospital to leave for France and is equipped to set up a 1,200 bed hospital. On its way is another important link in the chain which brings the best possible treatment to Canada's warriors. From captured Caen, combined artillery and air bombers smash an incredible barrage against enemy positions. warships miles away augment the barrage with their heavy shells. hard on the heels of the devastating barrage, Canadian infantry moves southward across the River Orne. Exploiting the advantage gained by using Carr as a springboard, the formations press the attack. From the Faubourg of Vaucelle, Canadians thrust in two spearheads. One moves astride the Palais Highway. The other follows the banks of the Orne past the junction of the Orne and the Odon. A great weight of armor is brought across Bailey Bridges, hastily constructed across the Orne. The tanks move into positions to probe Rommel's wall of steel. stages of the attack, the advance goes extremely well. The hail of bombs and shells has done everything expected of it. German guns and many positions were wiped out by a deluge of high explosive. The armor and infantry clean up remaining pockets of resistance. The advance takes no definite pattern, but fluctuates. Patrols bypass enemy resistance points as they reach for more forward objectives. Systems of communication tie the whole maze together. Pack wireless sets are an invaluable aid to liaison. Objective after objective is taken. 
Although a complete breakthrough is not achieved, advance is steady. Prisoners often clog the highways. A moment's rest is precious before the next attack begins. The phase that everyone hopes will mean the main blow against the Panzers. The blow that will smash through to Paris and beyond.